good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the next in our series of Senate occasional lectures. Uh, first of all, I'd like to apologise for Dr Lang, the Clerk of the Senate. She's unable to be with us today, uh, so I'll be your host today. I'm Brian Hallett. I rejoice in having Australia's most difficult job title. I'm the Usher of the Black Rod, um, so I'll be your Master of Ceremonies today. Um, today's topic's very timely. Media reporting of the next federal election, what can we expect? And of course, here at Parliament House, election talk is never far away. And the media, as we know, are a physical presence in the building. Uh, the press gallery is actually in the Senate wing. But at another level, it goes without saying that the media are also a constant presence in our electoral, parliamentary and political processes. Um, personally, I've always been intrigued at the level of political coverage that the Australian media undertakes. I presume there's a market for it. Um, so as the clock ticks towards the next poll, and now that the journalists and broadcasters are back at work after the midwinter press gallery ball the other night, um, it's probably a very good time to explore these issues. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome Dr Sally Young, who's the Associate Professor and Reader in the School of Social Sciences, Social and Political Sciences at the University of Melbourne, to explain to us what we can look forward to as the media prepare to report the next federal election. Can we please make Dr Young welcome? Thank you, and thank you very much for the invitation to be back here again. I gave the lecture in 2008 and I was talking then on politics and the media and today I'm expanding on that theme and being a bit more specific about election reporting and what we might expect for the next federal election. And I should um, say, I think, at the beginning about when I was preparing this lecture, what was on my mind. Uh, when I was writing this lecture, uh, Fairfax announced plans to shed 1,900 staff and erect paywalls for its online content. The following day, Fairfax journalists made public their entreaty to Fairfax's largest single shareholder, mining billionaire Gina Reinhart, to support their editorial independence. The next day, billionaire Rupert Murdoch's News Corp made a $1.97 billion takeover offer for Consolidated Media Holdings, helping billionaire James Packer achieve his goal of exiting media in favour of casinos so that Murdoch could advance his goals of greater domination in pay TV and sport. And as I speak today, there's still ongoing speculation that up to a thousand jobs at News Limited are at risk in Australia. News Limited, it's been announced, will be split into two different entities, one focusing on the more profitable entertainment aspects of the business and one on publishing. And there's possibility on speculation about whether some titles might close. So in all of this, there's a mix of the familiar, including the same media dynasties who've controlled large swathes of Australian content for decades, but also the new, and I don't mean, just mean a new player there, with strong interests of her own, but also big changes inside and outside media companies. And this is happening at a time when journalism is changing. The nature of journalism, its democratic and economic foundations are being reshaped. And nobody knows how this particular story will end. Not the journalists who are watching their industry transform around them, nor the owners or managers who need to decide whether to keep trying to secure the economic future of assets like newspapers, for example, or whether to retreat. And not the analysts on the sidelines, including academics like me, who are trying to make sense of what all this means. And it may seem that I'm digressing here from the topic at hand, media reporting of the next federal election, what can we expect? But I'm doing so for a purpose, to draw attention to the context that we need to think about when we're examining how the news media operate in Australia. And when we look at how the media report elections, all of this matters. We need to think quite broadly about what factors impact upon the reporting of politics, why certain themes and narratives are so prevalent. And we need to think as well about what constitutes good election reporting and how that can be encouraged in a climate of such upheaval. So on to the topic at hand. Uh, barring unforeseen circumstances, there'll be a federal election next year and it must be held by 30th of November. But according to Anthony Green, whose word I take on such matters, it's much more likely to be between August and October. There'll likely be a five, or if the Labor Party feels especially brave, a six week campaign in the lead up to polling day. And based on past form and present circumstances, how will the news media in Australia report this campaign? And will that fulfill all the functions we might expect of news outlets in a democracy in an information age? So I need to explain as well how I came to the views that I'm about to outline and the predictions I'm about to make. 
Uh, I had a large grant from the Australian Research Council that allowed me to collect over 10,000 election news reports, mainly from 2001, 2004 and 2007 federal elections, but some from 2010 as well. And these were mostly newspaper articles, television clips, including TV news and current affairs, but also comedy and breakfast programs, any clips that mention the election in those sorts of programs, as well as some radio reports and material from websites and so on. It was a, a very large collection of material. And I had the luxury because of this grant of being able to study that for five years, which you might think um, is hell, but I actually enjoyed it. And I used content analysis to analyse that material um, in a quantitative manner. I had some research assistants um, who also might think this was hell, um, and possibly some of them might be here today who work in Canberra now, but I had six research assess assistants working for about eight months, systematically coding this content and trying to work out some um, basic things for me that I was trying to measure. So things like, you know, how much do election reports focus on policy? How much do they focus on opinion polls? What sort of frames and um, sources do they use? How many sources? Who do they ask? Um, and so on. So I was trying to test all of the sort of familiar accusations about election reporting, that it's too obsessed with the horse race, for example, uh, that it's been dumbed down, that increasingly, re increasingly reflects entertainment values. It's the product of politicians and their advisors spin and so on. So I was trying to assess the validity of all these claims. And when academics set out to do this sort of thing, to test common perceptions, the truth is that many of them secretly hope there'll be some sort of myth buster and that they'll find that, you know, how we see things isn't actually true and we can think of afresh and, and think anew about how things work. But what I found and wrote about in my book, How Australia Decides, made me think that some of the criticisms are overstated, some are unfair, but alas, I can't be a myth buster because m many of them were indeed true and, and some to a surprising degree. And there might be good reasons for this or at least reasons that we can think of about why election reporting ends up in the shape that it does. And I pointed to some of those at the start, the Australian media, its systems, its institutions and organisations, its culture, Australian politics and the way it's conducted, well as how campaigning is conducted in Australia, but also news audiences in Australia, our preferences, our priorities, all of that comes into play. So with all of that in mind, today I'm basing these predictions on what I found in my study and usually political scientists are pretty wary of making election predictions, but I'm going to stick my neck out today because if I can't talk about or predict the election results, I'm pretty confident that some of these patterns will likely be true. I'm quite confident that unless something drastically changes, we will see in many cases some of the same tendencies and themes. So how will the media report the next federal election? A few um, caveats to begin with. Firstly, I'm talking particularly about the mainstream media, particularly newspapers, but also but online as well as printed newspapers uh, and television news. I know that not all media are the same, not all outlets are the same, certainly not all individual journalists are the same. There are going to be variations in how the media reports the election and those are important. But there will also be some generally occurring patterns, I think. And if my study of previous elections holds true, a lot more similarity um, perhaps than difference. So my first prediction is, and this is a, a pretty easy one, I think this will definitely be the case, there'll be an overarching campaign narrative. There always is, there has been, um, you know, if we look at the election reporting of the first election in Australia, there, it's reported in a way that there's a well-defined beginning, a middle and an end. And we know the campaign proper in media terms begins with the Prime Minister driving to meet the Governor General, asking for a dissolution of Parliament, TV crews wait patiently outside to capture that drive through the gates because it's so symbolic. Sky News excels at that waiting and filling in time for that particular moment. And then in the middle are the day-to-day -day campaign activities, especially of the leaders. These are all building up to the polling day and are usually reported in those terms. What does this mean for the election result is the question asked about each particular event on the day-to-day -day diary. On polling day, the Labor and coalition leaders will be recorded putting their own ballots in the box. That's another highly symbolic moment shown on all the TV news that night. And once the result is known, the winning party leader gives a victory speech, the loser a concession speech, and that marks the acceptance of victory and defeat. That's the narrative. It's traditional, it's obvious, and it's seemingly predetermined, but I'd argue that perhaps it isn't um, and perhaps it doesn't suffice because it causes a particular kind of focus in reporting. And that focus means when they're deciding which topics and which individuals are most newsworthy, there ends up being a striking degree of sameness about mainstream media coverage. 
and I predict this will be the case in, for the next election as well. So when I looked at previous elections, what I found was that 95% of the time, the five free-to-air TV news bulletins, the, the primetime ones, covered the same topic on 41 days of the campaign. So um, across the campaign, I'm, when I'm looking at their reports, um, and I'll show you a, a selection at the moment, in a moment, they were using often the same visuals, the same sound bites, sometimes even the same introduction to the story, the same words. And in newspapers, um, this wasn't quite so bad, but in 41% of the campaign, a story was judged so newsworthy uh, that every major media outlet covered it. So not just the free-to-air TV news programs, but all of the nine newspapers that I studied had it on their front page. So there's a lot of common agreement about which events uh, are worthy of the most attention. Uh, and let me show you some clips from, I'm just going to put up on the screen, clips from 2007, just one day in 2007 to give you a, a flavour of what I mean. Uh, and judge for yourself on this particular day, it was dubbed Tony Abbott's worst day or his uh, sorry and his apologies were the, the focus of the news coverage. So. Well, sorry was the hardest and most used word for Tony Abbott, Abbott today. The health minister had to apologise first to asbestosis victim Bernie Banton and then for turning up late to a television debate. As Jim Middleton reports, the minister's day to forget came as health policy took centre stage in the campaign. Tony Abbott, Ma OK, that, that's... One, let's have a look what the other news were reporting. Federal election campaign and it was a sorry day for Tony Abbott. The health minister was forced to apologise twice, once to an asbestos victim and then for turning up halfway through a scheduled TV debate. Oh dear, for a government trailing badly in the polls, every post has to be a winner. And there's the horse race frame, nicely encapsulated. There? What were the other news programs? The Prime Minister has turned the election campaign focus to health, announcing a $400 million plan to boost medical training. But his health minister stole the thunder, forced to offer two embarrassing apologies. Some dubious supporters wait for the Prime Ministerial walk. So we're the John Howard Ladies Auxiliary Fan Club. That's right. And be white. Be right. And be rich. And he didn't want their brand of health. A little bit, bit different there. The election campaign, and it hasn't been the best of days for Health Minister Tony Abbott. He's been forced to apologise for offending terminally ill asbestos campaigner Bernie Banton. Arrived half an hour late for a television debate, and his takeover of a Tasmanian hospital has been put on hold. Here's Laurie Oakes. No smart politician take... Last one the head of the investment bank Merrill Lynch but he'll get more than 160 million dollars for his trouble. The focus of the election campaign has shifted to health with both sides promising to spend millions to improve the system but the policy announcements were largely overshadowed by a problematic day for health minister Tony Abbott who was forced to make not one but two apologies. Okay, I think we can leave that there and if you watch the actual uh, news reports, you'll see that they use the same sound bites, as I said, often the same visuals and so on. There, there's unanimous agreement there that that was the story of the day, basically. That was the main story that needed to be shown. Um, and on newspapers as well, in newspapers you would see a similar sort of selection that um, journalists, you often ask them, you know, why do you select that story? Why was that the main one of the day? And they often tell you they have a gut instinct or they have a sense or they just know um, but you can see there that however they're deciding, they're, they're all deciding similarly. So my next prediction is that there'll be a same degree of um, similar coverage of topics, topics in particular, selecting what are the most newsworthy events, and that these will come, as that example did, from the two major parties' planned events, from their policy announcements or their public statements or visuals of them out campaigning. So to look at the content of election news is to see that reporting the day-to-day -day events of the two major party leaders is what is generally the substance of um, mainstream news coverage of elections. And you, we know that this comes from, um, in particular, the journal journalists who are accompanying the leaders on a bus or at a plane, who follow them around and you know, document their day-to-day -day activities, and that tends to be the reporting. And it's often junior reporters doing that now, while senior reporters watch and report from afar. 
And that roadshow we know is a limited sort of snapshot, it's stage managed, uh, journalists tell us this often. Um, but it's still a major focus in news media. And the main exceptions outside of this sort of diary, day-to-day -day style reporting will be when any gaffes are made by any of the main campaigners, which the media will gratefully seize upon. Plus promotion of any sort of media initiated pseudo events, so things like say the Great Debate for example or any media organised town hall meetings or other things that will be promoted. Um, although there's always the possibility of some self-promoting beat up by some or other radio shock jock as well. But in the main, it's these diary day-to-day -day events that, that capture the, the attention and uh, are the main focus. And it is undoubtedly, and this came through very strongly and I, I think will still be the case next time around, that the two major party leaders are the prism through which the campaign story is told. They are the only major actors, the only political actors who regularly get to have a say in their own words in most news reports. One or other leader, usually both, for the sake of even-handedness, we quoted or get a soundbite in nearly three quarters of front page newspaper articles and TV news reports when I was looking at them um, in elections in the 2000s. And their words will shape the news agenda. Their photos will be used to signify what the election is all about. You can see that in the background to some of those news clips. And the focus on them will be unrelenting and highly personalised. It will be almost as if the hundreds of other candidates running for office or the people they represent don't exist somehow. In the main, ministers and shadow ministers will be newsworthy when they make gaffes that in most cases, or otherwise you'll see them, particularly backbenchers or new candidates, appearing as a human backdrop, nodding away behind the leaders when they visit their electorate, but otherwise they're, they're not often there. And with the exception of Julia Gillard, and I think um, obviously that's a big exception, but female candidates will be underrepresented in election coverage. I found that they were usually not there, but if they were there, they were generally seen and not heard. So when I looked at news reports, I found only 10% of news stories ever included a quote from a female politician. And independents and candidates from minor parties are similarly excluded. Uh, during the three elections of the 2000s, only 5% of newspaper articles ever quoted any minor party politician or independent. Um, that might be a bit different perhaps this time around, but that sort of marginality is um, self-perpetuating. The smaller parties struggle to attract the media coverage they need to win public support. In other countries, we've seen a trend towards using experts in news coverage, so pollsters, political insiders, business leaders, people from NGOs, lobby groups, religious organisations, academics, union leaders and so on. In Australian election reporting, I found that trend wasn't quite as strong. Uh, mostly it's journalists calling upon other journalists to comment, although there's sometimes the usual suspects of party-affiliated spokespeople. But Overwhelmingly, the experts that are called upon to give their views, and I think this will still be the case in 2013, unless we see some major changes, will be male. I found only 1% of the experts that were quoted in newspaper reports were women, and on TV that was just a little bit better at 8%. And if history is any guide, it will be business leaders and other journalists who are the two groups that are most quoted as experts. The public will be surprisingly absent from election coverage in 2013, I predict. They're often seen as faces in a crowd or a shopping mall or their hands being shaken at campaign events. But the spotlight is so firmly on the major party leaders that only occasionally does any other actor steal their limelight. And for a member of the public, the most likely way to achieve that is to fall over when the TV cameras are around. <laughs> Uh, it's a cliche, but I found that it was that was definitely true that the horse race is the focus, and some journalists will say, well, well, so it should be. You know, this is a race, it is a contest, it's an election, someone will win, someone will lose. Um, but that if it is a contest, that sort of focus has grown over time. I saw it grow and grow from 2001 to 2004 to 2007. Um, in terms of particularly quoting opinion poll results, that has become one of the major um, sources of material that journalists rely on for election reports. Um, Rodney Tiffin has noted that journalists tend to report each new poll during election with breathless proclamations of its importance. And Peter Brent has said there must be some other countries more obsessed with political opinion polls than Australia, but they've yet to be found. <laughs> and that will probably be, I'd predict, magnified in 2013 because as we see journalism resources declining, less journalists, less resources to go and get the sort of scoops that come from journalistic investigation or the more spontaneous campaigning of old style politics that we used to see. Polls have really become one of the few ways that news outlets can initiate a story. They're promoted as an exclusive, a scientific reading of public opinion. They generate other stories. This is why they're so relied upon. And they'll be reported, I predict, in a way that generates a sense of uncertainty and unfolding drama about the election result. 
They'll emphasise change rather than stability. So even if the change from the last poll is small, inconsequential or within the margin of error, it'll still be reported in terms of this is different than last time and it creates this narrative of um, ongoing change. So, for example, um, when we looked at 2007, even though opinion polls had predicted that Labor would win for over 10 months, and with a strength and consistency that hadn't been seen probably before, the last polls to be reported just before the election were widely reported as showing a narrowing of the gap, a close race, a cliffhanger. And we see this each election, that as the polls get closer, there's this sense of, in classic horse race terms, the challenger surging towards the finishing post. Um, you know, Howard was said to be inside of the impossible, for example, um, in the last days of the election. And SBS reported it could be a cliffhanger after all. There's this sense of always the unfolding drama and change rather than a sort of bigger context about um, stability and what hasn't changed. And I think that's used deliberately so to, to create a sense of, um, you know, entertainment aspect for the election about who will win, who's in front, what has changed, what is being done to win, strategy and so forth. So in this focus, policy coverage I found was minimising over time. There were less policy issues examined, a smaller range of policies, less coverage given to them. And if that holds true in 2013, it's likely that when the media does report policy, they tend to do that on the day that it's announced by the, the leaders. And often then in terms of the horse race, you know, the question will be, will this new policy help Labor or the Coalition's chance of winning? Um, rather than, for example, providing any background or context or exploring what the policy is actually designed to do, uh, whether it will achieve its goals, how it compares with policies in other countries, and, and uh, many other things that could be done, for example. And the, the journalists might say, well, look, the parties are the cause of this problem. They release their campaign strategies late. They don't give us enough time to look at policies in detail and so on. And I think what this requires, if it's to be done, is the time, resources and expertise to do it, but also a different understanding of the news cycle, that, you know, if a politician hands you something at five minutes to five and you've got a deadline, um, you know, if you can't write a good story about it on that day, I'd, I'd ask, why can't you write it tomorrow or the day after or a week later or even before the election begins, think about policy issues and get a range of sources. Um, journalists will write themselves into the story in 2013, as they've been doing for some time, and, but not necessarily, I'd argue, in a way that helps the public understand journalism or the relations between media and politics. So it hasn't escaped journalists' notice that politicians exercise a high degree of control over the news agenda, and one of the ways that they fight back against that is to um, you know, take the initiative to talk and do analysis instead of, for example, just following the leaders around on buses and so on. Um, doing reporting opinion polls is one of the major ways they take the initiative and try to regain that. Writing themselves into the stories, telling us how politicians and their advisers are spinning to them. Um, and we've seen over time one of the outcomes of this is the shrinking politician soundbite, that sound bites are, uh, politicians are getting less sound bites and shorter ones. So it was down to 6.9 seconds was the average when I got my research assistants to stop watch um, a thousand news clips. Um, and 6.9 seconds is all politicians generally got, but reporters and other media figures in the story, including the news anchors and the journalists that were um, reporting on the story, usually spoke for three times longer than the politicians they were reporting on. And there might be questions about, well, whether this is appropriate or not, or not. Um, whether you think politicians should have more of a say or whether you think we've moved on from the sort of politician giving a speech and it being reported verbatim to having journalists analyse and contextualise for us. Um, you know, where the balance lies between letting citizens hear their potential representatives speak as opposed to getting some, you know, insightful analysis and opinion, which is important as well. So um, there's obviously a point of debate there. I predict the meta campaign will go on. This is the aspect of the campaign where journalists reveal to their audiences all the behind the scenes interactions of politics. Again, the, how politicians and advisers are manipulating the campaign. They, they highlight that to us, and rightly so. And we know a lot more about politics and how it's conducted, I think, as a result of this than we did 40 years ago because of the willingness of journalists to tell us. So at its best, med that sort of meta coverage gives citizens important information about how the electoral process actually works. But at its worst, it can also descend into simplistic representations or it can take a very cynical form. And part of that is that many journalists, and especially since 1996, I think I've seen this, bemoan how stage managed and sterile and boring the campaign is. And they use that sort of voice, I think, to distance themselves, to, to highlight their professionalism and their neutrality, their role in the campaign, 
demonstrate their distance from politicians and explain gaps in their reporting that are brought on by this um, effectiveness of political PR. But it also means often a world-weary sort of cynical tone can creep into election coverage. And quite frankly, it's boring to keep hearing how boring journalists find election campaigns. Uh, journalists will tell audiences how politicians control and disseminate information, but they're much less forthcoming about their own methods and tactics and motivations. So although they're writing themselves into the story more, I find that they're often not giving themselves the same critical scrutiny that they would apply to politicians or other groups. The self-analysis only goes so far as highlighting the importance of the media's role often, that it stops short of critically interrogating it. And so I don't think that meta coverage sort of frame of telling us the behind the scenes has reached its full potential to give audiences a real sense of how those interactions work between the media and politicians. There'll be a focus on entertainment, and this is a pressure that, that we see, um, you know, journalists know and point out quite rightly that, um, you know, a lot of Australians say they aren't, aren't interested in politics, that they find the election boring and that they don't, um, you know, watch. They switch off if you do too much politics or you have politicians on too much. So often they flick the switch to vaudeville to try and hook audiences in. And again, you might say that's fair enough. You know, if there's a, uh, I remember 2007, you know, there was some promotion of, um, you know, the election night result, you know, the sort of devices that were used to make that more entertaining, for example. We know there are pressures for journalists to, in this sort of environment when Australians, many Australians say they're not interested in politics coverage, to either give them something else or to try and make politics interesting and entertaining. And this isn't just a problem for commercial uh, media organisations, even the ABC's audience when they were um, giving results for their audience surveys in the 2000s, over time you could see that increasing numbers of viewers and listeners were saying that the ABC reported on too much on federal politics. So it's, it's a pressure. And when I compared Australian coverage to British and American election reporting, I found our TV news clips are already shorter. Uh, and for example, our broadsheet articles are often shorter as well. So in the current climate, politics isn't automatically given some priority. It has to win its place in the news, is what journalists are being told. And increasingly, audience members have other options, entertainment, leisure, media options. They often scan news and stay only briefly, and especially online. So all of these are very real pressures. But I think we'll see 2013 heralded the internet election because we've seen that prediction ever, every election since 1998. Um, perhaps this time it'll be more nuanced. They might be cast as the Twitter election or the YouTube election or a focus on social networking or smartphones. But we've certainly seen proclamation after proclamation. And while the technology is changing and all of this is very important, I think mobile technology in particular um, is a very interesting aspect of um, news journalism now. The fact will remain that next year, when it comes to getting election news, TV will still be the most important medium for the majority of Australians. Radio, uh, followed by radio, and newspapers will still be very important to setting the news agenda and influencing other media. These media still matter a great deal. So the question related to this that follows is whether the internet can save journalism and enhance election reporting. What we have seen is a lot of speculation about the internet and what it can do and does for news journalism and for audiences. But I would suggest the biggest effects of the internet, the evidence says, have been on news production. It's changed the way news is gathered, reported, disseminated, and it has particularly affected the economic models that news organisations rely on, which is why we're seeing this upheaval with newspapers. In terms of audiences, who accesses online news for um, political news in particular, which sites they visit, what they do there, what we're largely seeing is that existing inequities are continued online. So the political news audience online looks a lot like the offline political news audience, particularly in terms of what you might call quality news or detailed news, it's older, white, male, affluent, educated. So along with the challenge of how to find an economic model for online journalism, the challenge of how to get this technology to help engage new audiences, as opposed to just giving the old audiences different ways to get information, still remains. My last prediction, and I hesitate to bring this point up because I, I don't only have an hour after all, uh, but I can safely predict there'll be accusations of bias. There always are. <laughs> Conservatives will point to the ABC as biased against them and perhaps Fairfax, although that might be diluted depending on Gina Reinhart's role. While Labor and the Greens will point to the role of News Limited, including its tabloids, but also the Australian. And here I shall but note these claims and point out that I think there are very important issues there. Um, it's a hot debate and one that might yet get warmer. 
Um, I don't wish to avoid it, but because it's a side um, topic to what I'm talking about, I will. And I'll move on to what should we expect from media reporting in a complex age? What can we do to support and encourage it? We expect a lot of the media, and we're often promised a lot, but we know that this context for journalists to distribute and create election news is challenging, and increasingly so. Good reporting differs from outlet to outlet. If there's an aspect of what is good reporting, then that question really leads to an answer that audiences want and expect different things. I might have my own preferences. Um, not everyone wants a long analysis of a detailed policy issue every time. Not everyone wants a highly opinionated shock jock shouting down a politician or guest. Not everyone wants a sensationalised tabloid article. Not everyone wants a colourful or satirical piece on TV that makes them laugh. But so long as somebody wants these formats, then I think there's a place for them. But diversity is the key. There's a need for multiple formats of information and storytelling, but we have to recognise that some of these are cheaper than others. And in the current climate, when economic models for journalism are breaking down, we don't want to see the types of journalism that involve more expensive resources for research, investigation, detailed information and so on, to suffer while cheaper forms abound. Even if not everyone wants long-form detailed policy analysis, for example, it's still democratically important that it exists somewhere. And as I've said, diversity is the key, but it's a big problem in Australia, not just in terms of diversity of ownership, which is a problem, but also diversity in terms of topics, sources and perspectives. We've seen that, that topic selection, I think, stood out for me as one of the major problems, but there are also a very limited number and range of external sources used in Australian reporting, and, and some studies indicate that's not just political reporting, but reporting more broadly, say, compared to American journalism, for example. Cost cutting and, and declines in journalism staff are going to put more pressure on journalists to stick with the usual, to follow the leader, to have the story everyone else has, and to rely on news wires and political PR handouts. But now's the time to be brave, I'd argue, if not now, when? To go to a wider range of sources, find new spokespeople, be proactive, do research in the lead up to the election, and see policy issues not just in terms of the specific policies the parties announced during the campaign, but to uncover important issues before the campaign begins. What's at stake? What are the options? What are the costs and benefits? What proposals are being considered? Who's pushing which one and why? What do affected groups need? What do they think about these proposals and so on? What's worked elsewhere? What's failed? All of those sorts of issues, rather than waiting for a politician to announce it, to give a handout and uh, only leave five minutes for analysis of that policy. I think the next thing that's particularly important in Australia is we need more journalistic self-reflection, more transparency about how reporting works. We've seen in the UK the Leveson inquiry revealing the relationship between the political and media classes in for them, sometimes embarrassing detail, in a, in a way I think that will be cathartic in the longer term. In Australia we really do need to know more about how media and political power intersect. But there won't be such an inquiry in the short and probably even the long term because we don't have the conditions that produce that behaviour and then produce the exposés and the outcry. We don't have highly competitive newspapers, a range of owners, an independent outlet like the Guardian newspaper to uncover and doggedly pursue the hacking scandal, or crazy brave politicians in power who are willing and able to take on incredibly powerful multinational media organisations. So what we could do perhaps instead is, I think journalists need to be more upfront about how they get information and how they craft the reports they produce not to pretend that information just comes fully formed or that news is complete or that the story selection is somehow natural and self-evident. Tell us why you or your outlet pursued that story over many others. Tell us why you spoke to those two particular sources instead of ten potential other ones. Don't just tell us how politicians spin to us. Tell us why you go to those events and report on them instead of something else. Tell us why you can't, what you can't report on and why. And if you can't say that openly, then tell WikiLeaks or the ABC's Media Watch. <laughs> For example, if your editor is directing you to have a partisan slant to your stories, tell somebody. I know there are factors working against this opening up of journalism, including fears of losing one's job in an era of journalistic downsizing, and particularly in a country where there are few owners to work for. I also know there's been heavy resistance from outlets and individual journalists to propose media reforms in this country, which might produce greater external accountability, but I think that accountability would help journalists. Many audience members already suspect journalists and politicians are all in it together, too close, a bunch of insiders, but audiences want to understand how their news is produced and having reporters explain how journalists operate in this environment 
giving proper explanation of errors, sincere apologies that explain context, giving us greater insight into how journalists work and under what conditions would, I think, encourage more loyal audiences rather than having the opposite effect. My final point that I think I'll, I'll end on to open up to some questions is to say to journalists, let us help you. Help us help you. Let us not just as audience members or people who can post comments at the bottom of stories or ring with tips or supply a photo on our mobile if we're somewhere that accompanies your story. Involve us in a more fundamental way in researching, writing and distributing content. And we've seen this happening overseas where decline of staff has occurred. And some overseas news organisations have experimented in what some call pro-am partnerships, professionals working with amateurs. So, for example, in the US, the news press in Florida used a panel of retired community members, including retired lawyers, CEOs and accountants, who were working on stories with staff reporters. Or a different example, in the UK in 2009, at the height of the MP expense scandals, The Guardian was given uh, a lot of information, over 500,000 MP claim forms, and it couldn't look at all of them. It, reporters didn't simply have the time to do that. So they put those claim forms on their website, asked readers to trawl through their local MP's um, expenses and report anything suspicious. <laughs> Why don't we see that sort of experimentation in Australia? Here as elsewhere, there's a potential army of retired workers, young people, journalism students, academics, NGOs, um, experts, hobbyists. They could all have expertise, information, skills, motivations that are relevant to news reporting. It might not only enhance news reporting but forge a new relationship with the people formerly known as the audience. Give them, and it would give them reasons to be loyal, to be interested, to defend you when you're down and even to pay for your content. We know that civil society will have to play more of a role in shining light in dark places in the future if journalistic resources continue to decline. And so the media needs to facilitate that. We see examples already. So for example, in the US where a law lecturer and his students have been researching death row inmate cases and proving that innocent men have been executed. They've got the time, the detail, the motivation to do that. So journalists and news media have to invite other people in, people who understand policy and election implications. There are many out there who'd like to be involved. And when I talk about news media organisations forging a new relationship with audiences, I know I'll be accused of naivety and probably fairly, um, fairly rightly, because what I'm really suggesting is that managers and owners should voluntarily lose some control, and it's something they've resisted in the past. They resisted, for example, the new media internet vote in the late 1990s and early 2000s, and to simplify, but I think it's a fair criticism, it was largely because the mainly middle-aged white men from private schools running media organisations didn't understand the internet's potential and weren't very interested in trying to at the time. And we now see the repercussions of that. So I think journalism outlets need to be get more creative, but they need to be supported in that. They need to be given the freedom to do something different with election reporting. That means audiences have to allow that too. If we see something different than those sort of election um, news clips I showed before, then we should support that rather than saying, why have the other outlets got a story about Tony Abbott's apologies and this has got a story about something else? Um, we need to be more open to, to sort of difference in election reporting as well. And just for a final point on journalism and its future, we know this is a difficult time. It's difficult for journalists, it's difficult for anyone who cares about journalism, watching it struggle. And the biggest issue for organisations at the moment is to monetise their content online. They need to give us a reason to pay for news and that's what they're trying to work out at the moment. And yet when Fairfax announced its job losses recently, it was on the same day that it announced that it was going to erect paywalls for its online content. So when job losses are conflated with charging for news online, what audiences hear is that they're being asked to pay for something that is going to be less substantial and based on less journalists with less resources. So in 2013, it seems we will be asked to pay for more online content, but how will news organisations convince us that it is worth paying for? I know that many journalists are well aware of the challenges that I've described, and I can only hope that in 2013, enough changes, and perhaps all of this chaos is an impetus for it, that they're given a chance to try something different to try and address these issues. You can state the lectern if you like. Well, well, ladies and gentlemen, that was a fascinating lecture, and I'm sure there are there are lots of questions. I, I might get the ball rolling while while people think. But Sally, the, the thing that particularly interests me, which I alluded to in the introduction, is, um, and you mentioned in your your talk about um, how poll driven the news is and how how much coverage there is. 
Has there been any research done or have you done any research on the, at the consumer end about how much actual interest there is in the amount of political co and parliamentary coverage we have? It's an interesting point because you'll often get journalists and media organisations saying, we'd love to do something different, but people won't buy. You know, I'd love to have a detailed analysis of immigration policy and uh, really put a lot of research into it, but even if I did it, people wouldn't necessarily read it or watch it so or listen to it. So one of the interesting things about um, the field that I work in is that not a lot of research has been done on audiences and what they want. I think there's a presumption that the media organisations know because they know when circulation declines or ratings decline. And, you know, TV news and current affairs, for example, I've seen them, they, they watch minute by minute of when audiences go on or, or drift off and they say when politicians come on you just see it, it dive, for example. Um, so I think it, a lot of it is presumption and hunch and what do audiences want. Um, a lot of it isn't backed up by research or, or any detailed analysis. Okay. Thank you. I think we have a question on the left over here. Anyone who wash, wishes to ask a question, we have a microphone on either side. So uh, the gentleman on my left, sir. Uh, you left me with this dreadful impression that we're all sheep. So I thought to myself, is there really a question that will embarrass you? Now, my question comes from Hilaire Belloc, who said, don't have a second-hand mind. That's number one. The other man I'm drawing on is G.K. Chesterton. And G.K. Chesterton had this to say, all atheists are believers. So I'm going to leave it with you. Two questions you wouldn't expect. One is, how do you avoid having a second-hand mind? And the other one, that beautiful G.K. Chesterton, who wrote, Don John of Austria comes marching to the war. And so I'll give you J.K. Chesterton's lovely one. All atheists are believers. Now, there's two questions outside of your framework. See how you handle them. Uh, <laughs> all right, well, I think I'll handle them by saying that, as you pointed out, they, they are outside the framework of what I'm talking about today. I think they're more comments rather than, than questions for me. Well, well, question and answer is that. That's just a comment. You answer the question, please. Answer the question. Not, that's just a comment. Thank you. Thank Sorry you. to be... I'm, I'm, I'd answer it if I thought there was a question there that I could answer. But I, I think it's a little abstract for what I'm, what I'm talking about and um, I'd rather answer a question on election reporting. Okay, we might go to the gentleman on the, on the right over here. I've got something a little um, less abstract. You referenced <laughs> Australia's lack of a paper like The Guardian. And The Guardian is a paper that doesn't have a paywall. So I'm wondering mm. what the differences are about The Guardian that allow it to function as it does without a paywall. Yeah, it, it, that's a good point because, I mean, there's a lot of talk about how The Guardian is in financial strife as well and it doesn't have any magic formula for monetising online content and either. But because it's a non-profit um, body, it doesn't have to answer to shareholders and, and do cost-cutting in the way that we've seen, for example, uh, with some other media organisations. But it does have, you know, resources to do what it does and I think it does a very good job at what it does. But... Um, there are different circumstances there that we don't see in Australia, a body like that, that um, you know, is purely designed as an independent foundation or independent non-profit organisation that doesn't have to have those commercial pressures. Um, it's an interesting example of what could be possible, but we haven't seen any white knight, I think, in Australia willing to look at that news model. So do you think it's specific to the organisation of The Guardian or do you think it's something to do generally with British versus Australian news culture? Uh, do you think it's specific to the organisation or do you think it also relates to a difference between Australian media culture and British media culture? I think all of those, all of those things come into play. Um, I mean, th there's a different culture in terms of newspaper in the UK, for example. You know, you only need to walk into a, a news agency in the UK and there are titles there, whereas in Australia you might have, you know, in many cities we only have one major metropolitan newspaper. There's a, a competitive element there. Um, there's a different economic underpinning to The Guardian. There's a different, it has a, you know, a loyal audience, but it still, as I said, is struggling with some of those questions about how to make profit and how to survive in the long term. And, um, you know, there's a lot of discussion, I know, within The Guardian, and it talks about it on its media pages about how they're going to face some of those challenges as well. But um, it doesn't have any 
particular solution yet. It's still working on how to, it gets a lot of traffic on its websites, it gets international audiences in a way that many online newspapers don't. So it's got a capacity, but even so, it's still trying to work out those details. Thank you. Okay, we'll go to the lady on, on my left. Thanks, that was a really interesting lecture. Um, I just wondered when you talk about citizen journalism and the potential for that to, I suppose, play more of a role in um, election reporting, a lot of the commentary that's been going on in the last week or so in relation to the changes at Fairfax and News Limited and things has talked about how citizen journalism can sort of never be a replacement supposedly for real journalism because journalists have particular expertise in kind of information gathering and, and in particular in sort of seeing through spin is, is the, the one point that people focus on. I just wonder from all of the thousands of hours of media reporting that you've actually watched whether you think that's really the case, that journalists do have some core set of specialist skills, which means that they can do better or can do different things than uh, citizen reporters can? Or whether they're really just saying that to, you know, feather their own beds? <laughs> I think that, you know, they have specialist training, they have specialist skills. What's interesting about journalism training, you know, we're seeing a lot of people um, really wanting to do journalism studies, for example, or masters in journalism at universities and so on. There are a lot of people who want to go into this field even as the professional model is um, sort of collapsing around it. So you know, there are particular skills that journalists have. A lot of it is about experience. I mean, you know, someone who's worked in, in journalism for many years and knows the players and knows the context, there's surely a, a value to that. Um, I think what's interesting about the experimentation that's going on overseas is that you're pairing people up, you know, people who've got a lot of experience, who've worked in journalism a long time with people who um, haven't and might have a fresh pair of eyes and different set of skills to bring to it. Um, I don't think citizen journalism is, I heard someone speaking a while ago saying that citizen journalism is, is the answer. We, you know, the professional model's dying, we can't expect to pay journalists, the money's not there, the advertising revenue has gone, that model is not going to work anymore, we're going to have to rely on citizens to do journalism. And I think that, um, you know, is problematic. Um, you know, citizens can do a lot of things, all of us can do a lot of different types of things, but I, uh, organisations are important here. You still need some sort of resource for that. And we can't expect people to do it for the love of it. You know, there is a professional element to this. People need to get paid for this content as, as well. There needs to be some sort of model that can support that. Let citizens play a role, but still have an economic underpinning that's going to make this viable into the future. There's a gentleman on the right. Uh, you've spoken about uh, allegations of bias in the media. More recently, there have been suggestions that the media sometimes become substantive players, um, perhaps in relation to the allegations against the Speaker or the, some time ago, the Utegate affair. Uh, and there are many other examples, perhaps the, um, the Australians' campaign over the uh, schools' uh, proposals. In your predictions for the next election, do you think there will be a, an issue of the media becoming substantive players, in, perhaps in the sense of running campaigns rather than merely reporting? Um, two things I'd say about that. One is the media and journalists have always been players. And, you know, if you look back, say, at the 50s and some of the things reporters were doing then, they weren't just reporting from the sidelines. They were actively involved in, in the political behind the scenes going on. And, uh, you know, that, that's always been there. I think what's happening in terms of bias and newspapers at the moment is that as we're looking at them in business terms, as some organisations are looking at newspapers and thinking, look, they're not profitable. I just read um, before I came in that Rupert Murdoch had said today, you know, newspapers are a business and businesses need to be viable or they don't exist. Now, that's a bit of a worry for papers like The Australian, for example, that, um, you know, don't make a profit reportedly. So. If they're not making a profit, what are they for? Now, it used to be said that they're in the public interest. This is part of democracy. They're, um, you know, a fourth estate. They hold power to account. They do all sorts of democratic functions. But they also needed that commercial underpinning, those newspapers, for example. When they don't have that anymore, what are they left with? I think the reason we're seeing such strong accusations of bias, and I think we'll definitely see this going on, is that newspapers are playing... They're running campaigns deliberately, they're, using, they're being used as a tool of political influence because perhaps that's what they're really about, some of them. If they don't make a profit and they're not viable businesses, then what are they for? Um, and I think as that economic model has, has shifted, what some of the papers are doing and some of the owners are doing is using them at very 
um, obviously as a tool of political influence and running particular campaigns. And I think we're seeing more of that gearing up as the, the profit mechanism goes down. And I think for some of them it's revealing what they are really about. Sorry, um, during the Queensland election campaign, <clears throat> the Courier Mail journalists basically boycotted the, uh, the campaign bus and said, we're not going to play that game. Um, there seemed to be, as a result, a, a bit more sort of substantive um, analytical kind of journalism in the reporting from the, from the paper. Do you think um, that there's any likelihood that um, uh, that sort of tactic will be pursued in future? And if so, what might be the effect of it? It's quite possible because uh, that's happening, been happening in the US quite a bit as well. You know, there have been campaigns to get off the bus um, and some journalists, you know, as I said, the senior ones here seem to have retreated quite a lot from that. Not many of them travel around on the bus anymore, I believe. But in the US there's been more of a, a move away from that in a sense that the election really doesn't happen there, that that's all, you know, set up and staged for the TV cameras in particular and that the real action is going on elsewhere. Um, the trick is to get to, you know, what is the real action, what's, what's really going on. Um, and I think journalists can do that in a number of forms. I think we will see more calls to get off the bus because readers are quite aware because journalists are telling them, for example, in newspapers that these events are set up. You know, we went to a barbecue and they, they weren't real sausages. They didn't even cook them. They just unfolded it, TV got the shots and everybody left. Now, once you start telling us that that's happening, then we say to you, well, why are you going? Um, you know, and I think the trends that we've seen overseas, yeah, that it does help when journalists say, we're not going to go to this stuff. While you're setting up this barbecue and I'm supposed to get shots of it, other stuff is going on that, that's perhaps far more important and gets a better sense of the campaign and, and the issues at stake. So uh, I think a, a change like that is the sort of thing that, that would be a good experiment to try. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I think that um, almost brings us to time. Um, it's been an absolutely fascinating and very timely lecture, I would suggest, today. Um, could you please show your appreciation for Dr Young in the usual way? <laughs> and we look forward to seeing you at the next lecture.